viewers and listeners and welcome to another edition of the government information center this is a platform where we bring you very important discussion regarding the government plans and activities we are coming to you live from the gic studios here in eros and in today's uh, studio i'm joined by a panel of experts in the ICT, ict sector uh, i'm joined by miss linda ipinge who is the director in the information and communication development uh, that is in the Ministry of Information and Communication Technology. I'm also joined by Ms. Um, Emilia Nkembwa. She is the Chief Executive Officer at the Communication Regulatory Authority of Namibia and also joined by Ms. Robin Kleinhans. She is a Chief Legislative Drafter at the Directorate of Legislative Draft in the Ministry of Justice. But before we get into today's topic, which is uh, going to be on Namibia's ICT laws and policies in perspective, let us give the chance to our dear Honorable Minister of Minist in the Ministry of Health and Social Services, Dr. Kalumbi Shangula, to give us today's COVID update. Dr. Good afternoon. The, the podium is yours. Good afternoon, and thank you very much. Good, good afternoon esteemed panelists, good afternoon fellow Namibians. I will give the update for the 6th of April 2022, that is yesterday's. We have received 657 results in the last 24 hours reporting cycle and out of those 19 have tested positive for COVID-19, representing 2.9% positivity ratio. Among them are 10 females and nine males. The age range from two years to 91 years. There is follow, commas 11, all from Vinduk. Ochodonjupa, four, with Okahanja and Ochuwarango recording two each. Hangwena three from Angela and one from Karas in the district of Luderitz. Among the confirmed cases, nine are learners, one is a student and one is a health worker. Six of them are fully vaccinated. One has received a booster dose and the remainder 13 are not vaccinated. We have recorded seven recoveries, all from Zabezi regions. The number of active cases is now 246. 14 are currently hospitalized in six regions, and we do not have any patient in the ICU. One of the hospitalized cases have received one dose of COVID-19 vaccine, and the remainder 13 are not vaccinated. We have not recorded any death during the period under review. By the 5th of March 2022, the total number of 448,394 people who are aged 18 and above, have received one dose of COVID-19 vaccine, representing 30.5% of the adult target population. 132,874 have received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, while 258,070 have received two doses of other vaccine types. Consequently, 390,944 adults have completed their vaccination schedule, translating into 26.6% of the adult target population. A total of 128 individuals have received component one of Sputnik V vaccine 76 have received component two of the same vaccine. So a total of 204 doses of Sputnik vaccine were administered. 
15,148 children aged 12 years and 17 have received one dose of the Pfizer vaccine, representing 5% of the target population. Of these, 5,884 are fully vaccinated. Hence, the cumulative number of people vaccinated with the first dose of COVID-19, both adults and children, is 463,000. 542, of which 396,828 are fully vaccinated, translating into 22.3% of the total target population. 45,986 people have received a COVID-19 vaccine booster dose. In terms of summary, currently the cumulative number of newly infected confirmed individuals stand at 157,825 since the, pan the beginning of the pandemic. Total number of recovery now stand at 155,652, translating into 97.3 recovery rate. The total number of deaths due to COVID proper is 3,690 and we have 330 who are, who are registered as COVID related deaths, giving us a total number of individuals who died as a result of COVID-19. 4,020. Total samples tested so far 988,662. The number of individuals currently in quarantine stand at 144. Uh, this concludes today's COVID-19 update and I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kalumbi Shangula, uh, the minister of uh, the minister in the Ministry of Health and Social Services for today's COVID uh, update. Thank you so much. Now, to get into today's business, uh, we are discussing uh, the Namibia's ICT laws and policies in, in perspective. And if you have just joined us, uh, we are we are joined in the studio by experts in the ICT sector. Uh, I'm joined by Ms. Linda Aipinge, who is the Director of ICT in the Ministry of Information and Communication Technology. She's seated uh, right next to me on my left hand side. Good afternoon, Melinda. Good afternoon. And welcome. Beautiful. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, seated in the middle is um, Ms. R Robin Kleinhans. She is the Chief Legislative Drafter at the Directorate of Legislative Drafting in the Ministry of Justice. Good afternoon and welcome. Afternoon, Sia. Right. Thank you for having me. Last but not least, uh, we are joined by Ms. Emilia Nikemwa. She is the Chief Executive Officer at the Communication Regulatory Authority of Namibia. Ms. Nikemwa, good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. All right. Uh, to get into today's discussion, uh, the sector plays a major role as an enabling environment for information, communication and technology. The ICT laws and policy formulation have significant impact on citizens' lives and livelihood. However, the sector requires enabling legislative and policy framework to, to thrive. So. I would, I would want to start with Ms. Aipinge, who is the Director of ICT in the Ministry of Information, so to give us an overview of uh, some of the ICT laws and policies in place and what are their intentions. Thank you very much. Um, at the creation of the Ministry of ICT, which was then um, the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, the various laws and policies were being um, developed. And I would start with the uh, Communications Act, Act uh, of 2009. 
The Act aims at regulating the ICT sector and also establishing the, the regulatory um, communication, uh, communication regulatory authority of Namibia, which is then um, um, given the powers and function to regulate the sector. When I talk about the regulation of the ICT sector, I talk about postal, broadcasting, and telecommunication. Um, yeah, in terms of um, the, the policies that we have in place, we also have the um, ICT policy, the, the overarching ICT policy, which covers broadcasting, postal, and telecommunication. And the purpose of this uh, policy is basically to, uh, to set a framework for the development of the postal, um, telecommunication, and, uh, and broadcasting. Um, one of the laws that was passed recently is the Electronic Transactions Act, and really to, um, to, to provide for um, electronic transactions in the country. It allows for um, the promotion of electronic transactions in the country. Uh, this law is operational, but there are three provisions that are not uh, operational as yet. There is an advisory um, council that has to be appointed by the Honorable Minister of ICT, and the process is ongoing. There is also the provision on electronic signature that is not operational, waiting the um, appointment of the advisory council to advise the minister on the regulations on how to deal with those um, with electronic signature. The other one also pending the um, electronic uh, the, the, can the advisory council is the online consumer affair uh, the committee that has to be established by the, the council. To, to ensure that our, our, our stakeholders or our users are, are protected. Um, we also have uh, the national uh, broadband policy. And this policy basically sets um, the minimum standard in terms of the quality of, of, of service or the speed that you should expect from the operators that are regulated by, by the regulator. Um, I think I can end there for now. Thank you. All right, Ms. Ipinge. Uh, you have, uh, Ms. Ipinge, you have mentioned a, a couple of, of policies uh, uh, that influence the, the, the ICT sector in terms of the development of the ICT sector and so forth. I would want to move to, to Ms. Nikemba, the CEO of uh, CRAN. Uh, Ms. Nikemba, what role does CRAN play in implementing these laws and policies that, for instance, um, Ms. Ipinge mentioned here? Um, the role that CRAN plays is really policy implementation. What we do as a regulator, we encapsulate the government policies into a regulatory framework, which is made up primarily by the dictates of the Communications Act, but we then also take guidance from the policies that the ministry has put in place. So far, I think until the end of last year, our implementation model has been that of administrative licensing, where we then bring in the players into the regulatory framework by giving them the requisite licenses that they need in order to provide for services. But what we have started doing over the past six months is to re focus our attention from just mere licensing, but also to looking at those policy provisions that would create impact within the industry, either for the consumer in order to raise the correct benefits and to ensure that prices are affordable, there is accessibility, there is good quality of service, and also by making sure that the environment is, is, is fertile for the operators to continue providing the services and we then do this by ensuring that those that are dominant are not abusing their dominant on also uh, their dominance rather and also by removing any uh, barriers to market entry and any other restrictive business practices that may be um, in the industry which is, is is impacting the industry negatively so our role really is to translate those government policies into tangible um, benefits not only for the the consumers, but also for the operators that we regulate. All right. Now, if, if you have just joined us, uh, 
you can you can be part of this discussion perhaps if if you want to post your question you can join this discussion on our MI minister of information and communication technology facebook platform uh, our handle on facebook is ministry of information and communication technology you can post your questions there then we will attend to them and at half past the hour we will also open our lines so that you can take part in this discussion you can call in in the number the number in the studio is 061-400-397. That is when you want to be part of this discussion uh, telephonically. Now, moving on, M Ms. Uh, Kleinhunt, the le being a legislative drafter, is one of the critical areas that the Ministry of Justice play for all government or organization ministries and agencies. That includes uh, Ministry of Information. Uh, can you take us through uh, the process, how, how the can you take us through the process, how it is like, and what are the expect expectations of the Minister of Justice overall? All right, thank you. Um, I actually do think that the majority of the nation and people have a misconception about where, uh, as, as the legislative drafters, uh, where we lie in the uh, chain. Uh, when it comes to the legislative process. The legislative process is guided by a 1993 cabinet directive. And the first thing that a uh, line ministry uh, needs to do if they want to introduce new, new legislation is to approach uh, the office of the Attorney General. And they need to present it uh, to the office of the Attorney General to determine whether or not uh, there may be any constitutional barriers to the proposed legislation or whether there might be any hindrances from existing legislation. Now, before they even do that, the, the line ministries need to actually have a well-developed uh, policy uh, in place, uh, which is the foundation for legislation. If the policy in itself is not well developed and well researched and well um, put together, then the legislation that comes out of it doesn't really have legs to stand on, right? So as the process goes, it goes to the Attorney General, the Attorney General then decides yay or nay, then if the Attorney General decides yay, it can go ahead. Then it goes into the process of um, developing its documents, an explanatory memorandum, um, getting a layman draft set up, and then presenting it to CCL, uh, which is the Cabinet Committee on Legislation. And they will then go through it to determine whether um, it's on the right path, whether it does answer um, issues of policy, whether it um, uh, uh, answers a mischief, whether it uh, deals with a mischief that needs to be dealt with. Um, and then CCL will then decide whether or not it must go back to the line ministry or whether it can be presented to the cabinet for um, its approval in principle. Now cabinet also, it does not um, go through the draft bill or the draft legislation in detail. It just approves it on principle. And once it is approved on principle, um, only after that uh, will it come to uh, our directorate and then we would need the draft bill, we would need the policy documents, we would need the explanatory memorandum, we would need CCL minutes if any, and we will need the cabinet approval. And then we start working. Uh, uh. Uh, now, Ms. Kleinhans, uh, uh, my apologies. You mentioned that uh, legal drafting is, is quite, quite a process. Uh, uh, roughly, how long does it take the time frame to, to finish uh, uh, drafting these uh, policies? All right, well, it depends on what we have on our table. So, legislation can be anything from a bill, which will become an act of parliament, regulations, uh, which is um, f uh, uh, in terms of an act of uh, parliament, then we have government notices um, and we have proclamations, right? And general notices. Mm. Okay, so let's quickly deal with general notices. General notices is delegated legislation from local and regional, regional authorities. So if uh, a municipality or a town council, if they want a set of regulations to deal with an issue within their town, then uh, they will send instructions and that will be a general notice that we deal with. So uh, we have specific time frames for each of these uh, different pieces of legislation. Um, our time frame is that we want to finalize a bill within six months. 
these are our maximum time frames. Six months for a bull, four months for a set of regulations, uh, 15 days for a government notice, and then five days for a proclamation, which uh, must be signed by the president. Uh -huh. uh, now, um, moving on, uh, I would want to, 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 to get to you, Ms. Aipinge. Uh, the Ministry of Information and Communication is currently working on, on, on several bills and policies. Uh, can, you, can you kindly state some of them that uh, you are cu currently working on and shed light on the pro uh, how is the process like in developing these, these bills and policies uh, and, and, and what impact do they have uh, on the men on the street? Thank you very much. Um, as I've mentioned earlier that we have the Communications Act of 2009. Uh, you know technology moves uh, at a very fast pace. We are busy reviewing that Communications Act to ensure that it accommodates the emerging trends. That is one. Um, uh, secondly, I've also mentioned the postal telecommunication as well as the broadcasting policies. Uh, they are also outdated and we have done um, an assessment um, to determine to what extent we have implemented this policy since, uh, the policy since 2009. Um, we've gone through the process of National Planning Commission because uh, National Planning Commission does the quality assessment. And um, in terms of the quality assessment, they have given us a go ahead. Uh, and then we, we got also the cabinet directive. So we have a report that um, indicates how, how far we have implemented the policies. And also that is, is giving us then the go ahead for us to, to review um, and consolidate one ICT policy. Um, the, the other one that we are also busy with, um, we have uh, the, uh, you would all know that we are advocating for um, connectivity. Now, when you advocate for connectivity, people are connected ver through various devices. It could be your computer, it could be your laptop, or it could be your, your, uh, your mobile phone. We have noted that um, although the, um, the Environmental Management Act provides for the, the disposal of solid waste, there was a gap uh, for us to um, actually manage the, the, the waste. And now what we have done, or what we are doing, we have included the component of both electronic and electrical equipment, and we have developed a policy um, that is due for, 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 for adoption by cabinet. In fact, it was discussed at cabinet and it was referred to a special cabinet committee um, on, on treasury. So uh, the, the, the impact there is really to make sure, to make sure that we, we uh, we, we do away with the barriers in terms of the environmental impact of, 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 of these devices that are that are that can be that we, we that that can be dumped any, ev ev everywhere. Um, you would know that, for example, in local authorities, that um, you find so many dumping sites where both solid and electronic or electrical equipment is, is, is dumped. So we want really to, to make sure that the waste is managed in a more uh, professional manner. Um, and also the issue of your air conditioner, the electronic equipment or your bulbs. So this is one of the policies that we are busy with. In terms of the bills also that are quite critical, um, uh, one is the cybercrime bill. Uh, we all know that cybercrime is borderless. It affects all of us. Um, we are busy with the, with the cybercrime bill that really to, to regulate that, that space and also to create offenses and penalties for those that are not complying with that, with that particular bill when it becomes a law. We also are busy with the data, personal data protection bill really to ensure that your personal data out there is, is protected. When you give your data to somebody, um, let's say you open a, an account at a particular shop, we're placing obligations on those um, controllers of, 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 the, of your data to ensure that they are held liable should anything happen. So these are some of the, the bills and policies that we are busy with as a ministry um, at the moment. Um, and the impact is really like, uh, like I indicated for cybercrime that you want, we want our citizens to be protected. We also want those, are, those that are committing such crimes to be brought to book. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Aipinge, you, you mentioned earlier that uh, you have a couple of bills and policies that you are currently working on as a ministry. Uh, I would want you to, 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 
to to put it to us as to how how is the process like? Is it is it a cumbersome process? As as Miss Klein Klein Hans has just said that it takes a little bit of time. For instance, uh, from the perspective of a legal drafter, how is it uh, from your end as 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 the ministry in terms of formulating these policies and and, and bills? So what we do, like my colleague has said here, is that we uh, facilitate various um, uh, approvals at various levels. Like what we have done, we go to cabinet and cabinet um, gives us that uh, appro principle, approval in, in principle. We've also gone to the cabinet committee on legislation, especially, uh, I may, let me talk about the, the, the cybercrime bill. Uh, that has been on the card for a long time. Um, the process is quite long. Um, uh, one would know that the, the cybercrime bill was together with electronic transactions, and then the electronic transactions was passed. The cybercrime was um, separated from the uh, um, electronic transactions, and um, it really came a long way. I, I must really, with a heavy heart, also mention that the process was also prolonged by the fact that one of our um, our drafters, one of our experienced drafters who have been part of the process, has, has passed on last year. And that has really put um, a setback, and may his soul rest in peace. That's a, set, a setback in, in, in drafting, but I'm glad that my colleague from Ministry of Justice have been assigned now to take over, has taken over, and we are really hoping that by June, um, the two colleagues that are assigned will be able to, um, um, to, pr to submit the, the, the draft that will then subject to for public consultation, because in all these, we need to consult the stakeholders. Um, in terms of the data protection, it, it, it came also a long way. Uh, we, it, was also, it went through cabinet as a process. It went through the cabinet committee on legislation last um, October. Um, the cabinet committee on legislation actually ad, uh, assigned again the two colleagues um, um, that are assigned for the data uh, cybercrime to help us um, per perfect this bill. So we had a working session in early on March um, where the Ministry of Justice and ourselves and also a few um, uh, stakeholders just to look at what the comments of the Cabinet Committee on Legislation um, has, has actually highlighted, which were also subject to the public consultation. Um, it's really also unfortunate that it, 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 you one can have your own target in terms of saying, I want to finish this bill in this particular time. <laughs> but we have had experiences where, uh, because you depend on the approval or a go ahead from other, other, another institution, mm -hmm. it takes really time. But we are hoping that by around June, we have those um, drafted bills, and then we then uh, redraft it. Then we then go to, um, uh, back to the cabinet committee on legislation, and eventually also to, um, <coughs> to consult the stakeholders. Uh -huh. Thank you. Right. Uh, that was uh, very uh, educating. Uh, Ms. Nikemwa, uh, coming to you uh, from a grand perspective. Uh, Ms. Ipinge have mentioned earlier uh, a couple of bills and, and policies that, uh, that the ministry is, is currently busy with. So from a perspective of CRAN, when it comes to, to, to policies uh, and, and bills, what is the role that CRAN Place and and how is the process like in in in, in developing and, and and implementing these policies? Okay, so obviously, um, in terms of the hierarchy, um, the ministry is the policy maker, mm -hmm. and the minister is also the one that is responsible for legislation as far as the industry is concerned. So, as regulator, we are merely then consulted as part of that um, rulemaking process or as part of that legislative process. We will give our input, obviously, from an industry perspective, and also given. Um, the insight and the intelligence that we would have about the industry. And after the consultation process is finalized and the ministry has then gone through the process that was earlier explained by both my colleagues, we will then receive the policy or the law back um, for implementation. Now, what we do then is we formulate regulations under those acts that we are responsible for. I think as regulator, we have a unique um, setup where we are allowed to pass our own regulations without necessarily um, going through through the drafter's office. And once we have then formulated those regulations, at times we also um, cascade them down into conditions that we impose on the operators that we are regulating. And that is how then the policy initiatives are translated throughout the industry. Mm -hmm. 
as uh, as the regulators of of, of policies and, and bills, uh, do you perhaps give your input uh, to to government or to the ministry in itself to say that certain policies that you are formulating they 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 are good or they are paid for in terms of uh, the com the consumers. Uh, in, indeed, because you see, when you regulate, um, you regulate in the public interest, which means that whatever policies and whatever interventions you are putting in place, you must ensure that they will generate um, benefits or interests for the consumers. Now, the tricky thing with regulation is that you want to be proactive, especially when you regulate a technology-driven industry. You want to be proactive in um, creating innovation in the industry. So you always want to be on the lookout for those particular innovative ways in which you can then um, formulate the policies. But at the same time, then you also have to be responsive to the needs of the industry and ensure that those needs are then translated into, into policies. The other issue is that the policies are not just for the operators. The policies are also at government level. Mm -hmm. And we all know that the ICT sector is an economic enabler. Mm -hmm. So it is also our responsibility as a regulator to ensure that we are implementing those policies that would lead to the entire country benefiting from ICT mm -hmm. being the economic enabler that it is. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Ms. Aipinge, you, you have mentioned earlier about the drafting of the data protection and, and, and cybercrime bills. Uh, when are these bills likely to be finalized? Um, thank you very much. Like, like I've indicated, it's, it's very good to set targets, but sometimes from our lessons we realize that with drafting, it becomes a bit of a challenge to have um, the, the clear targets. Uh, because of other processes that are involved. Um, I mean, I look, for example, the drafters that are assigned to us, and the reality is that they are understaffed in terms of the Ministry of Justice. What they're doing, they're assisting us at, at the moment, mm -hmm. and they're doing that um, after hours. It's like not, not on your normal working hours. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a challenge, that, like, 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 um, like I indicated, but what we, ha we are hoping for is that at least by, by June, we will be able then to have these documents from them that then we will be able then to consult the stakeholders and then uh, we'll have to take these bills back again to the Cabinet Committee on Legislation because the Cabinet Committee on Legislation or CCL directed us that we, we go back and, and we look at, the, at, at, at these bills. Mm -hmm. So by June, we will be able to, but our hope is that during this financial year, we really should be able to sign this off. These are the bills that have come a very long way. Mm. And the nation is waiting, um, especially for, for your cyber crime, that the crimes are being committed and the public out there is crying. Ms. Mm. Uh, 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 Klein, Klein Hans, Ms. Um, Aipinge uh, mentioned the, the, the bottlenecks that, that are coming from the side of legal drafters that is from the Minister of Justice. Then my next question to you, perhaps maybe I know it's going to be a question that could fit to be asked by to, to, to the HR officer, but I would want you to give us your view. She, she mentioned that uh, some of, some of the, the hindrance to, to completion of these bills and so forth, it's because the Minister of Justice is understaffed in regards to the legal draft. What could be the reason? Uh, don't we have expertise in the country? See, to be honest, right, um, we are a small directorate, we are understaffed, yeah. but it's not so much about the number of staff members, it's about the capacity. Yeah. Now, um, I've been with the directorate about nine years now, and um, I've been told by others that I need to embrace the fact yeah. that I am a specialist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't feel that way yet because I still feel like I have so much to learn. Mm -hmm. Now, as Ms. Ipinga said, uh, we lost Mr. Willem Baker, Advocate Baker, last year due to COVID, and he was this treasure trove mm -hmm. of knowledge and of experience. And when he passed, unfortunately, he took all of that with him. Um, and thus, it, it created a little bit of a vacuum um, but we do uh, try to work as a team so that we can um, 
fill the gaps for one another where we each feel we, that we have a gap in our capacity. Um, but honestly, it does take a long time uh, to really be an expert in your craft when you're a legislative drafter because you have to be a little bit of um, a jack of all trades when it comes to the law, uh -huh. right? So that you can be the master of one. Great. Um, and so that is basically a little bit of what our issue is, is that uh, we're also, if you, if you look at our, um, at our average age, we're a young mm. directorate. Mm. Um, so we're all still very much, we, we learn as we go. It's one of those um, uh, specialties where you learn as you go. Mm. Uh, as you become more experienced, uh, you become better at it. Mm. Um, referring to the two drafts that uh, Ms. Apinge mentioned, um, I am personally also involved with uh, both the cybercrime and data protection. Mm. Cybercrime, yes, we do have our target of June, mm. but as uh, myself and my colleague are working on it, we foresee that we will have to have a consultation uh, with the ministry uh, within the next couple of weeks, because as we're going through it, we're like, we have questions. And that's often what happens when right. we sit with a bull. We go through the bull and we're All like, right. we have uh, questions. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Robin. Now, while we are at, at, at cyber issues, uh, Ms. Ipinga, I'm coming to you on that. Uh, I would want to tell, to inform our, our, our viewers and listeners, those that are watching on, on various uh, uh, platforms, be it listening on, 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 on radio or television, you can join this, uh, this important discussion here in the studio by calling uh, on the number 061-400-397. Or you can join our social media page, which is the Ministry of Information and Communication Technology. You post your question there, then we should be able to, to pose them to, to the ICT experts that we have today in the studio here. I understand we have uh, a caller online. Caller, good afternoon. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, sir. How are you? Hello. Good afternoon. All right. Uh, can I go ahead? Yes, please go ahead, Thomas. Wonderful. My question is directed to the panel. It may be more the ministry and CRAN uh, that could be the one affected by the question, but I'd really love them to answer it in a concise manner and really get some thought. The ICT industry, uh, we, we know that we cannot do ICT if there is no electricity, in a rural village, a rural uh, what have you. That's where the technology needs to get to. Now, we know that current legislation is industry and uh, we also know that uh, the funding within the industry is mostly 70% private individuals, uh, private individual companies, you know, the heavyweight industry and all that, the ICTs and so on. And they are doing their job to do what they can to take uh, ICT technology out there, make it as visible, make it in the hands of the consumer, and so on. The consumer may be located in the rural areas, wherever they are located. Now, in these rural areas, you have a lot of electricity shortage, uh, and that is regulated by another regulator, ECB, and is funded through a different mechanism, which is also having a similar maybe 30, 70 percent, 70 private, and then 30 percent, that's where government really comes in, in terms of getting it out there. So what you get is a gap between these two industries, but they need to work together to actually deliver the, the final result. In terms of strategy, what is our five-year plan in closing that gap, harmonizing that gap, or having the two teams sit in the same room uh, or align the funding to speak to the same problem. Uh, I, I would really love to get some answers, or maybe if someone think about it and come back to us and give us answers. Um, that's really what I'd like to put across. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Thomas, for your contribution. Your question is well noted. All right, so thank you. Right. Uh, before we take uh, that question, uh, dear panelists, I, I would want to, to come to you, Ms. Ipinge. Uh, we were just speaking on, on issues of uh, cyber, cyber issues, uh, and the cabinet has recently approved the National uh, Cyber Security Strategy and Awareness Creating Plan. Uh, can you briefly talk us through um, 
this strategy with special focus on aims and objectives and what is expected. Yeah, thank you very much. We, with the absence of the cybercrime um, law, um, we have, as, as government, recognized the need for us to have a targeted focus in terms of um, or cyber, uh, cyber security. Uh, I've mentioned that cyber, cyber crime is, is borderless, and we need to, to ensure that we, um, we come up with the, with the, with the, with the targeted uh, intervention. So it's really for that reason that we then um, developed the, the National Cyber Security Strategy and Awareness Creation Plan. Um, the Council of Europe actually um, was in the country and they've, they've helped us, but in other words, the final product that went to cabinet was a function of the interministerial uh, or interorganizational um, uh, committee that then put this work together. What we're trying to do is really to, like I said, a, a, a targeted or coordinated manner to ensure that um, th th there are four pillars actually, if I can mention, to say the first pillar is for uh, the, ta the, the strategy looks at the enabling legislative framework. Uh, and this includes your cybercrime bill and also your data protection uh, uh, laws that have to, have to be in place. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second one is on capacity. We know that we need to build capacity, especially on uh, law enforcement and also you know, dealing with these cybercrimes. The, the third one is basically on international, uh, actually national, regional, and also international cooperation. Uh, I can't emphasize this also to mention that cybercrime is borderless and we need to really work together uh, mm. in, in ensuring that um, the, 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 we, we are coordinating. And I must really also mention that uh, there are various stakeholders that have expressed interest in helping government in, in, in terms of that, uh, the coordination or the cooperation. Uh, but I'll touch that in the next point, which is the fourth pillar, then this is awareness creation. Mm -hmm. What we really have noted is that, yes, we don't have a law in place, but when you look at the crimes that are committed, it's by individuals. And uh, if, uh, I, I always give this, ex this example, um, like especially with uh, awareness that as an individual, you know very well that you are not expecting a parcel from DHL, as an example. And you receive a link and you click on that link, that can compromise your network or the network of your employer. <laughs> and that is what we have realized. Or if you have never entered any competition and you see an, a message that comes through that say, says, play along, and you play along. So uh, that is a, it, it's a serious concern. So that's why we are saying we need to educate the public to really uh, take responsibility and be aware of the danger of cybercrime and the importance of cybersecurity. Um, to that end also, we have stakeholders that, came, that came on board. I think you, you have noted Crane also has been running, has been running various um, um, sessions on consumer awareness with regards to the, 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 the cybercrime or cybersecurity. We also had um, one of the organizations, South, South Essential IT, that has come on board, and also to really make sure that we are uh, putting that message out there because we want to cooperate and, co and, and, and do this in a coordinated manner. I'm also happy to announce that I think tomorrow as a ministry we'll be having our session with our ministerial staff just to educate us because we can be the, the, the risks to, the, um, um, to, the, to, the, to the, our networks. So we are planning on launching the, 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 the strategy and awareness creation plan and we're also planning to have a separate session just to talk about um, the strategy and awareness creation plan. Uh, but briefly, that is what I can mention for now. All right. Uh, uh, th thank you for that, uh, Ms. Ipinge. Now, uh, I would want to, to move to the next question. Although I also want to take you on to the next question that was posed by the caller. Uh, the caller um, uh, alluded that uh, Namibia has issues of uh, network ICT network coverage, especially at, at grassroots level. And now this brings me to the next question that I wanted to ask as to uh, what are you doing as the ministry uh, to, to ensure that uh, you, you populate the ICT coverage, especially at grassroots level, more especially at a time when the country is battling of COVID-19. Uh, uh, learners were starting to embrace the use of uh, ICT and all those sort of things, but then uh, schools that are uh, at in villages, grass grassroots level, they are finding it very hard to connect to 
to, to, to ICT facility, especially internet. What are you doing as a ministry in terms of the long-term plans? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as, as I've highlighted, we, we have the Communications Act, but maybe before I even get to the Communications Act, I would like to really um, just state that as, as a ministry or as a directorate responsible for ICT development, we don't receive funding for any capital investment or for us to roll out this infrastructure. The infrastructure that is rolled out today is by either your, your, your government uh, entities, operators, or the private entities. That thing that is, that is quite key. Is the role that we play is to create an enabling environment. I've mentioned the Communications Act. In terms of the Communications Act, there is a part four that deals with the Universal Service Fund. And this is the fund actually aimed at bridging the digital gap between urban and rural areas. Um, CREN has um, put in place the regulations. The Ministry also has um, put in place the Universal Access Service Policy. And they are all aimed at accessibility, affordability, uh, uh, and, and uh, yeah, accessibility and affordability and, uh, and all that. And we also have, uh, I mentioned to you, the national broadband policy. And the national broadband policy that sets the minimum standard in terms of the speed that you would expect from the operators that are regulated by, by, by CREN. Mm -hmm. So our role is that of creating that enabling environment of ensuring that we put the laws and policies in place so that um, those that are in the business can then be guided by these laws and policies. If they are not complying, the regulator is there as an independent body uh -huh. to ensure that they are dealt with uh, with regards to the, um, the provisions of, of the law. So that all is right. really that I can mention. Yeah, all right. Thank you for that. Uh, we have uh, a question from our social media platform that is asked by Bravo Maria. She's asking, why is the representation of the ministries not much seen in remote areas, only in suburb where you can see the ministry? I think that is now in reference to, to, to ICT infrastructure in, in, in grassroots level, and that is exactly what you have just explained now. Uh, I would want to, to, to move to, to Ms. Nikembwa, uh, and I want you to put it briefly because we are, we are running out of time. So as part of Crane's key focus area, which is to facilitate the adoption of technological innovation in the ICT sector. What are some of the key highlights that uh, CREN has facilitated so far? I think the most important activity that we have had is the Universal Access Fund. Mm -hmm. So what CREN has done is we have a GIS system where we have mapped the country and we have also mapped the telecommunications grid mm -hmm. and we know where the gaps are and we know which areas have service and which areas do not have service. Mm -hmm. When you look at population coverage as a country we are sitting at around 80% mm -hmm. which is a good number but then when you zoom into the regional representation you'll find that places like Commerce, Erongo, Oshana are doing very well. But when you move into places like the Kunene, the two Kavangos, Ohangwena, and the Zambezi region, you would find that population coverage is around 33%, which means that we have a lot of gaps, especially in the remote areas. The other item that the, the, the gap analysis has revealed is that we have around 1,800 schools in the country, but only 400 of those schools actually have data connectivity. And we are not even talking about connectivity where the entire school is connected. It's probably an ADS a line that goes into the principal's office or so. So for us as regulator, the concern is really that the schools and the remote areas, the clinics, and all the community centers where people come together are actually not connected um, to, to telecommunication services. The second issue is that, as Ms. Ipinga mentioned this earlier, government does not do any capital investments into the ICT sector. The entire rollout is left to the operators, but the operators are business entities that are there to make a business case and to make a profit. Mm -hmm. And we want to um, applaud our operators because as part of 
their social responsibilities in certain instances because of the license conditions that we have imposed as CREN, they have gone out into the remote areas. But it is not enough and it's not happening at a good pace in order for us to ensure that um, we have coverage. So what the Universal Service Fund is then supposed to do is to collect money so that we can then provide coverage and access to those areas um, that, that do not have services. But the, the dilemma that we have had is that for the past 10 years, the section that would enable us to collect the levy for the fund has been caught up in litigation and we have been unable to collect money and this is why the fund is sitting empty for about 10 years and the schools are sitting without connectivity, the clinics are sitting without connectivity. And, and what we are doing now is really to try and engage our relevant stakeholders, including government, to see how we can start collecting money into the fund and hopefully be able to bridge that gap that we currently have. All right, uh, Ms. Nkembwa, uh, if, if I heard from you co uh, correctly, you have mentioned a lack of resources, which is funds, uh, that are hampering you to, to, to implement some of the laws and policies in ICTs. Uh, would you perhaps maybe um, uh, allude to us as to, are there any other uh, challenges that you are facing in, in, in developing and implementing these ICT laws so that uh, they change the lives of, of Namibia, and especially in the ICT sector. Briefly, please, the time is yes. not on our side. Um, I think there's two issues that I would want to highlight. The first one is that it's not enough for you to have access to telecommunication services. They must be affordable, and the quality of service must be right. We've recently just done a study where we saw that comparing Namibia to other countries in the SADC and the African continent, our data prices are very expensive, and that has become a barrier to connectivity because not everyone um, can afford to uh, buy the services that we are we, we, that the uh, operators are selling. Mm -hmm. the, the second issue is that you would find that you have village A and there is an operator that is providing services in that village. Mm -hmm. But the next village has no connectivity, but operators do not want to share infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So now you'll find one village has two towers mm -hmm. of two different operators. Mm -hmm. But the next village has zero towers. And our position as regulator has been that uh, operators must start sharing infrastructure. All because right. if you can share one tower in one village, then mm -hmm. the second one will not be duplicated, but it will then be taken um, to, the next, to the next village to ensure that there is then coverage yes. and connectivity. All right, Ms. Nikembe, I know you have so much to, to explain to, to the Namibian, especially in regards to... To, to, to the laws and policy in the ICT sector. But briefly, what do you, uh, what do you anything, any message that you would want to leave uh, with the viewers and listeners for today? I think the message for us as regulator is just that we are going to implement the policy mandate that, ha that government has given us, mm -hmm. and our primary focus in the next 12 months would be to bring down the mm -hmm. price of data mm -hmm. and to ensure that we increase access and connectivity. All right, Ms. Aipinge, briefly, please. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I would just like to thank you for having us. I think this will be continuing uh, discussions. Mm -hmm for really us to uh, get uh, into the details of, the, of what we have, we have mentioned today, because time is not on our side, but I think we have a lot that we need to share. Thank you. All right, uh, Ms. Uh, Kleinhans, your final words? Yeah, no, just thank you for having us and for giving us the opportunity to explain a little bit about uh, the insanity that we go through every day. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you so much for, for those uh, thoughtful words that you have just shared with us. And thank you so much, ladies, for, for joining us uh, in GIC studio for today. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our discussion for today. Uh, we had uh, very good experts in the ICT sector that joined us to unpack and dissect the topic around the Namibia's ICT laws and policy in perspective. From me, Hossi Dipo, your host for today's session, and our uh, production crew, have a blessed day ahead and see you again um, Monday. <laughs>